and always remember save frequently and when you're done every time you're done using after effects purge all memory and disk cache to free up space and you'll run faster okie doke good evening jacqueline hope you and yours are doing well and howdy is one of my favorite greetings it's right up there with ahoy brilliant just like mr burns on the simpsons I get the cultural reference. I was a huge Simpsons fan for the first seven seasons, and then when they changed the writing staff, it just uh, never recovered from that. And so, like I said, we're going to be picking up from the last lecture. I'm going to be doing a short recap, and then we're going to just dive right back into it. Joe, what I was thinking, and this is what I want everyone to know, when you're going to be doing rotoscoping, and tracking and planar uh, tracking as well, you want to be at full resolution. As we all know, this is where you change your resolution. I always tell people, hey, if you want to speed up your workflow, change your resolution, make it something lower so that your computer can render faster and you could focus more on how things are moving because, you know, the first rule of motion design is worry about how it's moving, then get it to look the way you want it to look. So dropping down your resolution helps, but you have to be at a full resolution before you start your tracking and rotoscoping. So make sure you're at full resolution. And here's my original clip. It was uh, the phone busy log. And up here in my effects controls, there's Mocha. So I'm going to click Mocha to get back into Mocha to where we left off. And what you should have is you should have two layers. Well, actually, we just did one layer last week. We were working on the hand. That's where we stopped was on the hand. And the recap for that is you always want to make sure you're on a crisp frame where the full shape is on the screen. Makes it easier to track. And you start off with the X spline tool right here. You click. And you want to use as few track points as possible. Like that. And then when you're done, you right click to close your shape. And remember, these handles, you can influence them all at the same time. I just right click and choose selection, select all spline. Pushing closer, you see, gives you nice soft curves. Further apart, gives you harsher, sharper angles. So it all depends on what you want to roto. And you can pick the individual points and move them, or you can click and drag and move multiple ones by moving them this way or adjusting the transform boxes on them. And that's your basic workflow in a nutshell. And lastly, you can grab the white bounding box and move the entire shape should you need to. Just watch how many points you have selected when you do have them selected. And then you just go over to your tracker and either track forwards or track backwards based upon where you are in your video clip. And that's how we got, I'm gonna delete my layer up here that I just drew. And that's how we got this hand. And we already tracked it from last week. We tracked the hand forward and backward. When you're done tracking something, Click the gear. It'll keep all your keyframes. Oh, I'll go refresh one more thing. If you click the plus key over here, you'll add a keyframe. So I can go like that. And if you need to delete a keyframe, you click the minus key. We clicked off the gear on the layer name. Then we went to our layer properties. And in the blend mode, we chose subtract. And what it's going to say is I want you to ignore this shape when you go to track this phone. Okay, that's what we're telling the computer. That's why we did the hand first. And that's why we did it sloppy because it doesn't need to be perfect. We're just saying, hey, ignore this because these four corners, you can't see them all the time. If we did this with the four corner tracker in After Effects, you would not get an accurate pin once those were covered up. This is why Mocha is so powerful, so useful, 
and I hope you all experiment with it more after these classes because you can do some truly amazing things with it. And again, remember, once you've tracked, just turn off the gear so that the computer says, okay, we're done with that. And you could hide your layers by just clicking the eyeball icon, same as in, what's it called, After Effects. And now we're gonna focus on the phone. So I'm gonna hold that. I mean, I'm gonna hide that and I'll redo it. All I did was I figured I'm gonna track a larger area than I need. And I'll show you why in a second. And I'm just gonna right click here to end my shape. And I'm going to make these corners, oops, sorry, I only grabbed one of them. Right click, come on, right click, selection, select all in the spline. And I'm going to make them less rounded so they're a bit sharper because of the shape that we're tracking. I'll drag this down a little bit. Any questions on this so far? I'm going to call this one phone new. Okay, now this phone is a plane, even though it's, you know, got its shape. When it twists and distorts in space, it's, we're going to set up a plane or a planar track right now. I'm going to show you how to do that. And what it's basically going to do is just take all the information from this, like the perspective, all these are going to be clicked on the transform, the scale, the rotation, the skew, the perspective, because I move this around in every axis. So we got our shape and we're going to put the shape under the hand because that's the way it is in the scene. This hand goes over the phone. So you got to have your new shape under the phone. And remember, you want the gear on what you're going to be tracking. Your default is the essentials. And what this does is it shows you the bare bones view of Mocha. So you're not overwhelmed with a lot of options and it's just faster and easier to learn. So we know the basic roto shaping, rotoscoping shapes and how to track forward and backward. We're going to change from essential to classic. Right up here at the top essential to classic and you see there's a ton more stuff that's why you know I waited to teach you the basics then we'll go dive a little bit deeper into it and in here we can toggle off and on mats that would be right here and you can just click that to turn it off and on like such and if I wanted to see the hand, I'd do selected all mats. So that's all we did was I chose right here with selected mats and clicked to turn it on like such. So we could see what we're doing. I'm going to go back to the essential workspace right here, just like that. And we're back to where we were. We just see what's going on a little bit better. Now I'm going to show you a new tool in Mocha. So we've got our shape and we're saying, hey, focus on this area right here. This blue S, well, the blue and purple S show planar surface. I'm going to click that button on like that. I just click. You see it lit up blue. And I've got a blue box inside my spline layer now that I just made. OK. I'm going to go back to the chat and see if there's any questions on that. Again, make sure perspective is clicked on. We're going to be tracking all of this with this planar surface, the transform scale, rotation, skew and perspective because I bend this phone in every direction. Now, this blue area is the size of what is being replaced. Like what? But we're going to swap out with the screen. So I'm going to get this to where the actual screen is. And if it's a little bit bigger, that's fine. It's better to have it a little bigger than to see the screen screen. You know what I mean? No one's going to say, hey, that's a couple pixels over the size. No one's going to know. So it's for this when you're learning, it's better safe than sorry. So I'm going to make it a little bit bigger like that. Remember, 
the gear is going to tell Mocha what to track. We already tracked the hand, we turned the gear off for that. I'm gonna track this plane right here, and so I'm already on my first frame, so that means I just track forward. And the track forward button is right over here. And I start my track. And I'm gonna hit stop. I am going to put, go back to the first frame. I forgot to show you something. There is, I can click this pink grid here. And this, if I start moving these handles, see how the grid distorts? Like that. You wanna make sure this grid lines up with your phone or you know that it's in perspective because if you see this right here that's not lined up i'm gonna hit undo and again see how it's moving in 3d space so it's lined up pretty good now i'm going to do my track and again all i did was just click this grid right here so that you could watch it while we're tracking and it's holding very well i'm going to stop it right here and i'm just going to add a frame a keyframe right there by clicking that key icon just because I'm doing good and you never know if it's gonna go and now here's where it starts tilting in the perspective so we're gonna watch it and make sure that it holds and that's why this grid is gonna be helpful see here comes the tilt now can you see how that grid is following the perspective of the screen this is what planar tracking is and it's not just replacing a phone screen. You could paint out um, the side of a bus using this technique and put in something else. It's uh, really, the, it's a limitless for motion design and visual effects. So here is our layer panel, just like in all the other Adobe things. The gear is what we're tracking and you can show or hide things by clicking the eyeball icons. These are the essentials, which is what we're tracking and how to track forward or backward. And in layer properties, you can access more options. So, and this was where we said subtract the hand. Next, I'm going to click on the show surface tracking data. So that's already on. Okay, good. We did that already. That was the blue thing up top. We got that out of the way and we already turned on the grid. So we did that up at the top, but this is also where it is right there. So we're done with this track. We're gonna hit save and then we're gonna exit. Here I am back in After Effects. And here we are with the Mocha controls. And I'm going to twirl down the arrow that says tracking data. Now I'm gonna click on the button that says create track data. And a pop-up window appears. I want phone new. That's the one that I drew. This is what I did beforehand. This is the one I did tonight. Phone new. And I'm gonna click the OK button. Either you're all playing um, Animal Crossing on your switches or you're absorbing this quite readily. Then I'm going to press forward and keep going on. This is the four corner pin right here. And the layer that you are going to be replacing on the screen has to be the same proportion as this image okay now I already have my pre-comp made I'll show you how I did that I made a shape layer over the phone you could see here's my shape layer below so I knew the exact size and then I just made my composition the same size as the shape layer like right here it looks like it was 640 by 115 and if I go composition settings yeah see it's 660 by 1170 so it was like close enough I just was too lazy to do it precisely but like I said this is a good way to see the size right there from that's how you get there the drill down from the shape that I drew over the phone and then I just made my sequence I mean my composition that size by going to my composition settings and then what I was going to be replacing in it I just did scale and position until I had it fitting the way that I wanted to and remember if you hit the P key that's position if you hit the S key that's scale if you want to see them both hold down shift and then hit 
the letter on your keyboard for what you want. So I already hit S to show scale. I hold down shift and hit P and now I can see scale and position. What I did to get it to fit. And then I just pre-composed all that together. Okay, no questions. So we twirled down tracking data. I clicked create track data, chose the layer we wanted. The option we want is corner pin. I'm gonna do corner pin support motion blur just so that I don't have harsh edges and I get to borrow some of that motion blur from the image. Then I chose my layer right here, screen replace, and I just hit the apply export. That's what tracked it there. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. I'm gonna go back over that for you one more time. Here's my phone with nothing selected. There's nothing selected now. I just grabbed a shape layer and I made a shape that was the size of the screen that I want to replace. And since I'm lazy, I'm going to put my anchor point right there. And this way, I can just grab it that way. And that is how I figured out the size of the screen. So I drew my shape, made it match up. Remember, I showed you, you can do things by eye or mathematically. And this is the size of that shape that I drew. So I just made a composition that was the same size as the shape I drew. But the one I made was 660 by 1170. So once I had my composition for what I was replacing on that screen, I just adjusted the scale and position of my footage so it's where I want it to be on the phone screen. That help you out, Joe? So once that screen replacement image was the right size, the right scale, and then the right everything, what I'd done was, you saw this part with the create track. How I chose the create track button, selected the layer, and then hit OK. And it's gotta be one of the layers with the gears gotta be on to read it. So I chose that layer. Then down here, corner pins support motion blur. I chose the pre-comp of what I'm replacing. And then I hit the apply export. And now let me drop down my resolution. You see the phone screen rotates with the plane that we have. But as you see, my hand does not go over the screen, okay? So what we're gonna do is we duplicate this movie clip again and we're gonna roto out the hand. So this is what I did. Here's my duplicate movie clip and I threw Mocha on it. I'm getting this warning because I'm not at full resolution. There I am at full resolution. And let's see, okay, there's the hand. So again, you want a good frame. And all I did was just grab my spline tool and get a much tighter, cleaner selection on the hand. And remember, you can move the points around one at a time, or you can click and drag, and you could move them from here, or you could adjust the bounding box. It's whatever workflow works for you. Moving these a lot at a time helps you keep the shape and it also speeds up your workflow. And once you've got your shape looking the way you want, you track backwards and then track forwards. And that pops up because the image is completely off the screen. And the faster my hand moves, the more blurred it gets. So you want to make sure that, let me zoom in. You want to be on the inside of that blur because you could always feather this in After Effects and you'll be able to control how much of the feather there is that way. And like I said, it's just a matter of going through and cleaning up the parts you need to and you track the entire thing. And when you've got it looking the way that you want it, you go File Save and then you exit out. 
I'm going to show you the settings. So when you're back in After Effects, here's my hand. Okay, this is where I put the effect on. All right, what I did was I twirled down the mat and I clicked on Apply Mat. See, this is what it originally looks like. So I just clicked Apply Mat and now you can see what you rotoed out. So when you're rotoing in Mocha, you click the Apply Mat and that will mat out the shape. When you're tracking the screen and we wanted to replace it, that's when we used our tracking data and then corner pinned it. That's what those two sections do. I then put that hand over top of the screen replacement layer because that's the way it is in the shot. I turn on my color correction. Mocha needs to be above the color correction. Now it's fitting in the scene better. And since I pre-composed that, I was able to put on some spill suppressing and some key cleaner. I'll twirl down those and show you what I did. So I put the key light effect on and I chose some green because my phone had a green screen to help me track. And I just cleaned up the edge of it a little bit. And then I put on a refined soft matte effect. And here's what I did with that. I gave it a little bit more of an edge. I smoothed it, feathered it to soften it out a bit. And I reduced the chatter and decontaminated the color. That's how I cleaned up some of that. So now we're gonna tie it all together and I'm gonna show you one more option. I have the clip that I called uh, Chip Blue, okay? It's a potato chip and this is what we learned to rotoscope on. All right, and we all saw how time consuming that was, but you had to understand the concept of rotoscoping. We're gonna do mocha on this chip, like that, and we're gonna click mocha to go into mocha. Now I wanna show you something. This chip is a plane, okay? I'm, I want everyone to get this concept tonight. Even though it's a potato chip in shape, it's a plane and we're going to track it as I tilt its perspective and move it around on all axes, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my X-Blind tool up here and I'm just gonna draw a small shape on it. And then I right click to end my shape. I'm going to, whoops, the daisy. I keep forgetting to do that tonight. Right click, come on. You can do it, selection, select all and spline. When I push out, they get sharper. When I push in, they get softer. I'm gonna go with a sharper angle. And remember, like I said, this is a 3D plane, even though it's the shape of a chip. A butterfly's wing, that's a plane. A stop sign, that's a plane. A billboard, that's a plane. Planes are just edges of shapes. You could track someone's cheek as a plane and then put some visual effects on it. Is everyone starting to understand the idea of planes and how it's a side of a shape that moves around in 3D space? Does everyone get that concept? So we're gonna treat this potato chip as a plane. We're gonna click on the show planar surface. We're going to click on our grid. As I move these corner handles around, you see the grid start moving in 3D space. And I want this to line up with the chip as accurately as possible. It's about having that snapped on perfectly. The blue handles is how we adjust the grid. I keep grabbing the red, sorry about that. Okay, that's looking like it's lining up pretty good. Took me a little longer than I wanted it to, sorry about that. But I'm pretty happy with that. Was everyone able to draw a shape, show the planar track, put the grid on, and get the perspective 
to match as closely as possible to the perspective of the potato chip. Remember you grab the blue box to adjust the perspective of the grid. All right, everyone's good with that. So we just track forward and backward and make sure perspective is clicked on because I will be rotating this back and forth in space. The backwards track worked perfectly and it kept the perspective. I'm gonna move my playhead to where my first keyframe is. The red is what I need to render. The blue is what has already rendered. Remember, if you need to subtract, click the key with the minus. If you need to add a keyframe, click the key with the plus. So now I'm going to track forward. And when I move and there's some blur from the uh, shutter speed being too slow, that's when the track is going to go off. So I've got my hand over the stop button to get ready for that. I stopped it and I'm going to add a frame there. See, and there's my triangle. So I've got my frames. Let me add a frame here. There we go. I'm going to save it and I'm going to track forward. It's still looking all right. I'm going to add a frame there just so I know where it's still good. Okay, here's where it's going to get off. So I'm going to add a frame there. I'm going to go forward again. Oh, it's actually doing all right. See how it is matching the perspective and add another frame. And I'll go just a little bit longer. And I'll add a frame there. That's enough tracking to show you this idea. So we've got our plane and it's tracked. Any questions on that first step? I turn off the gear because we've already tracked it. I'm going to turn off the eyeball icon. I'm going to turn off the grid and I'm going to turn off the show planar surface. Now I'm going to name this. I'm going to call this uh, plane track and I'm going to draw the shape of the chip and I'm going to get very accurate with this. And I'm going to show you why in a moment. Normally I said when you're tracking one use as few points as possible showing you a little trick tonight because we have the time oops that's what happens when you hit the space bar so i'm going to delete that layer because that went south real fast and i right click to end and I'm gonna move these up a bit away from my finger just so I don't have to worry about my fingers when this moves. Cause I'm showing you a little trick here. So if you've got something like a bat wing or a butterfly wing and or a stop sign, anything, I drew my shape very elaborately, but watch this little trick. I go to layer properties and I'm gonna call this chip. So I've got my chip and then my planar track and the planar track I'll turn on and the gear is off there. I'm going to, with my chip selected, I'm going to go to link track to plane track, which I'd already tracked. I'm using that data and we're going to watch how this shape, there will be some work needed, but watch how we're going to save some time with the rotoscoping process. Go back to essentials over here. Let's scrub through. Check we already tracked. Look at that. See how it's holding that elaborate shape I did on the chip? That's because the shape of the chip is not moving. It's constant. But the perspective and the angles of it will change. Now it's just the motion blur that is going to make the track go off. But look at that, we got several seconds of a clean track already just by treating this as a plane, tracking the plane, and then linking 
to it in the layer properties. This is why Mocha is more powerful than the Roto Brush in a lot of aspects. And then we're going to scrub forward a little bit more. And I could just grab these frames here, move them, and every time I do that, it creates a new keyframe where I was just at. And then remember, the more points you drag, the faster you can work because you're not treating each one individually. You can drag from here or you can use the transform handles. Let's see. There you go. And we track that. So I'm going to hit save and I'm going to exit. So if I want to see the mat that I just made, I twirl down the mat and I click apply mat. And now you can see through that chip. So that's one way of silhouetting that out. And as we went before, well, if we want my thumb over top of it, then I would have to duplicate this film clip and put my hand over top of that to get that to work. And that's how you do it. You just pick it apart piece by piece and you'll get your best rotoscoping and tracking, breaking things down into as many shapes as possible. Like, you know, tracking one finger, then this finger, then that finger. You don't want to make one enormous complex shape. You know, track the chip, then track the thumb. And, you know, that's how you manage your splines and your layers in Mocha. Any questions on that workflow? Okay, so remember, break it down, and then you're either applying a mat or you're using the tracking data. And then you can corner pin things even corner pin with motion blur to that stuff that you tracked. So let's say I've got the word chip right here and I'm going to click on my mocha layer at the corner pin motion blur and I'm going to click the create track data choose my planar track hit OK and then I'm going to choose the chip, the word chip, and apply it. I'll drop down my resolution. And there is the word chip following the track. I'm going to apply my mat. So there's the mat that we just wrote it out. And there is the tracking data of the plane we used when we created that intricate roto shape. Oh, here's, I just did a quick, I had the shape layer follow the plane and then I wrote it out my hand and put it over top of it. So that's what that would look like. I could get goofy with things. This image had a lot of blue to it. So I went in my levels and then I put a shift channel. I chose the blue. I did an invert and then I applied a little bit of blur. And that's how I kept some of the highlights of the face. Another way of doing this, I'll show you real fast. I'll hide all these and there's my face. You can use the extract. Effect. So we'll put that right here. And what extract does is you can say, I want to get rid of the highlights. So I start dragging from here and you see the highlights start going away. Like such until you get to the part where you want and you go, okay, that's about what I want right there. And let me show you something pretty wild. So you drag them together, but if you drag the bottom corner, that will feather what you're taking out. Like that, so it's not as harsh. And I'm doing the luminescence, and you can see right here, you could use this slider as well. And now she has a potato chip face.
this right here was an example of the um, knolls and paths that I'd shown you earlier. About two weeks ago, the beginning of all this stuff. It, I'm gonna pause it here. If I did an oval, this effect would not work. I had to use the pen tool. So I made an oval shape with the pen tool. I'm just gonna roughly draw this out real quick. So there's my shape. I'm gonna do no fill. I'll make this pink or red just so that you can see it. So with my path selected, down here, hide this. Remember when you draw a shape layer, here's the twirl down to get to the path. You select the path here, then you go window, window, create nose, we'll gotta select the path first. Window create nose for path, there we go. And what I did for this, I did trace path. Before we did the points follow nulls, and that's when we had these actual path points follow nulls, which is a good workflow for when you're character rigging. But I did trace path. And there is my null right there. So then you can get any shape you want. Oh wait, that made a mask on the null, that's funny. So no layers have to be selected. And I'll make the screen just so it stands out. So click the word stroke, say no to the stroke, click the word fill, give it a solid fill. And I'll hide all the layers below it. And then lastly, I just parent by pick whipping this to the null. And there you go gonna follow it around and you can just hit the U key and change the speed of this if you want you can easy ease them go in your speed graph remember pulling away this is going slower into it going towards this first keyframe it's now going faster out of it if I go in the opposite direction it's going slower out of it and then to get it out of your speed graph, click there. And it still loops, but it has a completely different feel to it. And for this one, I was just messing around with the other day. All I did was made a solid layer and I threw the effect turbulent noise on it. Now we've used fractal noise in the past, but turbulent noise, uh, some people feel gives you a more organic look. And what I done here, I chose dynamic. I chose spline, I upped the contrast, and I brought down the brightness. I increased the complexity to get a lot of these strands, then twirl down the transform. I increased the scale. Uh, this is 272.9. This was it at 100. Um, like I said, I zoomed in on it to see more of that interesting lightning string web type of look. And did the sub settings and I keyframed animated the evolution. Uh, I think I did one full spin over a certain amount of time. So that was the grounds for getting this look. All I did was, like I said, I just animated the evolution of it. So then I pre-composed it 
and I put CC lens on it to give it this orb like crystal ball look. And I messed around with the size and the convergence. Watch what happens with the convergence. You could remember anything with a stopwatch, you can keyframe animate. So you get it to where you like it and you can keyframe animate that however you like. I then, so that was the lens. I then put a glow on it. And remember when you're working with glows and light effects, you want to be at a 32 bit um, bits per channel, 32 BPC. So here's my glow settings. And remember in project, in the project panel, you alt or option click down here on the bits per channel to go from 8-bit to 32-bit. And here I adjusted the size of it so it's larger and doesn't fully fit on the screen just to see a bit, little bit more of this complexity just for a change of pace. And then I just hit the space, and then I just, I just hit the space bar to render it out. And while I'm here, I'm going to show you something else. Because even if no one's fielding me any questions, I can still give you some extra knowledge so that everyone gets their tuition's worth. That's the name of the game in this class. I want everyone to get their money's worth. If you've got a grayscale image and you want to add some color to it, there's uh, two, two ways that you can do it. Well, there's a lot of ways, but you could use the tritone effect right there and just change the colors that you want. So I could go from white, let's just the fun of it let's make it a bright red that's what tritone is you just pick three different colors and you could choose how much you want to blend that with the original and remember you just click the effect over here to hide it so tritone is one way another way you can do it is colorama Colorama, oh, just to warn you, it's a little bit bright. And right here, I twirled down the output cycle. And if you don't feel like doing your own color, there's presets. And you could always blend it with the original, just like with Tritone get a bit more subtle of an effect like that so that was tritone and colorama I'm gonna click off effect to hide that also you could use tint remember if you use fill it's gonna give it a solid fill color what tint does is I can say uh, let's change the black values to let's just say blue and you see how that is tinting the process and then I could say well let's just change the whites to let's just pick yellow for the fun of it because we're fun people here it's all about having fun I'm having a hoot hope you are too so there I just changed the white and the black you could just change one of them you know or both of them and again amount to tint you could fade down until you like what you're getting and if I work off of a more limited palette, I could just do two different shades of blue. And I definitely uh, smell what The Rock is cooking with this one. I'm liking this color combination. Be right back. I'm going to refill my glass of water. Oh yeah, that's right. You said the only difference is uh is the color. Okay, and remember, let me zoom in. Boom. This is for all those who need the refresher. Whenever you bring in an Illustrator file, this is your toggle switches and modes. These are your modes. I click the toggle switches and modes. Here's my switches. 
So these are switches. These are modes. And these are the modes. And you click the toggle switches and modes to go between them. And you always want to continuously rasterize by clicking that middle gear. And that way your Illustrator file will look good. No matter how much you scale it up. So we'll do the top sneak. All right, now let's experiment with a few things. Let's try a wave warp. And as you can see, the wave warp will animate through the whole like such. Let's try the wave not the wave height, let's do, let's change the width of the wave. See like that, see the difference? Now let's change the speed. What do you think of that so far? Yeah, um, now remember, and uh, since you were in my, uh, what was it called? Digital imaging class. I said, when you want to see what an effect does, go big and then dial it down. And we saw what the wave world, uh, the wave warp was doing. And we're like, oh, you know what? Hold on a second. Let's go back down to eight bits per channel by alt or option clicking here. In the project, see that got rid of that effect. Uh, er, yeah, so I just reduced the wave height and then I increased the width of the wave so that there was less of them. And you could even just keep adjusting these even more so until you're getting the look that you want. It's all up to you as the motion designer. That's with the sine wave. That's the square wave. See how that changed so radically. Triangle. It's all about experimenting and playing around and trying to have some fun while you do it. <laughs> That's pretty wild. So it's the same effect, it's just a different output. I mean, it's the same effect, just trying different presets, give you different looks. So that was Wave World. And, you know, like I said, the wave height is how much the body is going to slither. That's all up to you. And then the width is how many body segments are going to be moving. Let's try, I left the direction where it was. You could experiment with the angle of it. And see if you like that. But uh, like I said, you could always hit undo to get to where you were. You could experiment with the phase as well. was wave warp. You could also puppet pin if you wanted. And then you just move your playhead and make sure some go in one direction. And then the opposite direction. But that's going to be a lot of keyframing, and if you're happy with the other one, I was just giving you a second option. I 
Okay, under lighting. Okay, now just letting you know you're larger than 1920 by 1080. I'm just pointing that out. If this is the aspect ratio you want to work in. That's that's well and good. Um, Okay, so you want to add some color to this to look like lightning. There are a couple ways to do lightning. Uh, you can do a particle system. You can do, let me do new adjustment layer. Remember, an adjustment layer will affect everything below it. The lightning is clearly going to be going vertically. Okay, so with lightning, You've got this origin, which is where it's starting from. And remember your crosshairs, you can click and drag, or you could move the thing here. And then your direction, remember your crosshairs, you can click and drag however you want. So you set your shape up to however you want that to go. And you can colorize it. But the most important thing to know about lightning Let's say it's going to strike here. It should only be a couple of frames maximum. And I'm going to test something out. We'll see if my theory is correct. Okay, so that idea was wrong. There we go. That's the magic I was looking for. Um, so first I gave it a blending mode of a screen or you could do add, those are good for light effects. But what you gotta watch out for is it's gonna brighten up the entire image. So let's just say we see it for three frames. So if you're at 105, 108, okay. And then I'm going to just trim that. That is holding down Alt or Option. And then the two little brackets next to the letter P, the one that is the second bracket will trim the out point the other one will trim the in point you can even have multiple flashes of lightning we just let's see how that let's see if that's too long then we'll duplicate that one more time. Actually, we don't even need to duplicate. Yeah, we will duplicate that. And if you hold down shift when you drag, it'll snap to the playhead. Okay. So, we've got our basic idea here. We've got the lightning. And... Let's put a glow on it. Radius. Drop down the threshold. And obviously, since we're working with light effects, we're going to want a higher bit depth. And I Alt or Option clicked on my bit depth down here till I got to 32 bits per channel. And we're going to want this to brighten up a bit. Because think about this way. This shot was set to the exposure that you're seeing. And then once this light effect comes in, it's going to brighten up everything because your exposure is now different because you had the camera set up for the uh, original shot. Grab that glow effect one more time, paste it on here. And it's funny, my three frame guess was what your color correction was. It was three frames. Well, I'll drag my render bar and I'm gonna hold down shift to snap it to that edge. And I forgot the cardinal rule here. Lightning doesn't strike twice in the same spot. So I'm just gonna Move this second one. Okay. 
and you could have go to diagonal or whatever you want. That's all up to you as the designer. I'm just showing you some options here. Okay, now these clouds would look much better if they were moving, okay? What I would suggest is silhouette out these, this foreground, have that its own layer, have your mountains right here a layer, have this back mountain its own layer. You're probably going to need to autofill this as in uh, Photoshop. Are you familiar with using content aware fill and separating out layers in Photoshop? And you could do a particle system for both of these to have it move. Okay, good. Does that help you a bit with the lightning and the lighting? Do you want me to send you this file for a reference on the lightning? And again, uh, this is the extract, and I'm just dragging from the darker edge, but this time I'm targeting the blue. It's looking pretty decent. I'm going to next just do a quick mask. The layer is selected. That's how you get your mask. It has to be selected to draw a mask. Don't forget that. And I'm going to choose add is what's inside the shape. I'm going to change that from add to subtract to subtract that. And I'm just going to feather this like two pixels just so it's not actually I'll feather it a little bit more because this is further off in the background, so it should have a softer edge around it because the camera would be out of focus at that point. And again, if anyone has any questions, just send them my way in the chat. Let's try the roto brush just for fun. See where that takes us. Again, like I said, there's always more than one way of doing things. And it's really just finding the right tool for the right job and what works best for your workflow. And like I said, it was working better up there, so I just clicked the invert to make it do what I wanted. It's not half bad. And again, when you're compositing a scene together, if this is in focus in the foreground, the focus would fall off further it got backwards. And most importantly, when you're using blurs in After Effects, uh, some of them are huge memory hogs and will slow down your render. So it's about experimenting with what's going to work the best for you. And I only rotoed out that one frame, so that's why I am freezing that frame. OK, 
Okay, so I just gave an evolution keyframe. Let's uh, knock that down a little bit. And I'm also going to, oops, I'm going to position keyframe this cloud. I'm just doing something different than a particle system just for a change of pace. I can duplicate that layer, put it here. Front, this is at the mountain. Okay, so the mountain is above that. This needs to be on top. That's what's going on, okay? And don't forget, I said if I've already thrown in some keyframing and I wanna move that second cloud, I click the word position, not the stopwatch, cause I'll lose all my keyframes. And if my playhead is over one of those keyframes and I move them up on the Y axis, they move up on the y-axis uniformly together. And I could also move them on the x-axis uniformly together as well. I clicked the 3D enable for each one here in my switches. I can add a camera now. New camera, or I go up here, layer, new camera. I right clicked in the timeline to get there. Okay. And remember with parallax, you want the Z space. X side to side, Y, y up and down, Z forward or closer to the camera. So that needs to be further back. Again, I had both my keyframes selected for this middle cloud so I could move it back on the Z axis uniformly. And when you work with your camera, you hit the C key to get the camera tool up here. This is your all around orbit. I should say rotation. This will hit C again, and this will orbit on the X or Y axis if you hold down shift. And then again, this is your pan from side to side, pulling down shift, and then tilt up and down, pulling down shift, hit C again. This is your zoom out, zoom in camera. And I have these bushes way too far up front. And the more Z space you have, the more parallax you will create with your camera movements. And when you're animating your camera, the least, the fewer keyframes you have, the best, the better, my mistake. So I'm just going to animate the zoom. Click that stopwatch, move forward in time. Zoom in. And I'm just gonna ease those keyframes to get a smoother camera movement. I right clicked and got there that way. And that's just an example of stepping out that scene and parallaxing it and animating the clouds. I think particles would look better, but I just wanted a quick render and to show you how I've got a layer in between each one, each part of the space.